Good morning. Welcome to Sharon Mennonite Church this morning. Um, we're going to start with some worship. If you could stand and join us. Uh, the first song we're doing is called This is Amazing Grace. breaks the power of sin and darkness whose love is mighty and so much stronger the king of glory the king above all kings who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder and leaves us breathless in awe and wonder the king of glory the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You lay down your life. That I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nation. With truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love, that you would take my place, that you would bear my cross. You lay down your life, that I would be set free. Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. Are you hurting and broken within, overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is calling. Have you come to the end of yourself? Do you thirst for a drink from the well? Jesus is calling. Come to the altar, the Father's arms are open wide, 
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and mistakes. Come today, there's no reason to wait. Jesus is calling. Bring your sorrows and trade them for joy. From the ashes a new life is born. Jesus is calling. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are blood of Jesus Christ. What a Savior. Oh, what a Savior. Isn't he wonderful? Sing hallelujah. down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior, isn't he wonderful? Sing alleluia. As you wait for the crown, tell the world of the treasure you found. Amen. I do drink of its work I do sing on it my Savior both bruised and crushed showed that God is love and God is just You beckon me, you draw me gently 
To my knees and I am lost for words so Lost in love I'm sweetly broken Holy surrender Undeserved life have I been given through Christ crucified? Call me out of death, call me into life. I was under your through the cross I'm reconciled. At the cross you beckon me, draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love. I Lost for words, so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. At the cross, you in me, draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender, at the cross you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees, and I am lost for words, so Lost in love, I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. Amen. You can be seated. We call the ushers forward for the offering this morning. And um, when the children come up with their money for the house, kids go up to the front for the special offertory song. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we we come to you this morning with hearts of praise and hearts of gratitude. And Lord, we just are so thankful for what you've given us. And Lord, we just pray that this morning we could open our hearts and give back to you. And that our uh, gifts would be uh, furthering your kingdom and furthering the work in our community and in our world. For it's in your name we pray. Amen. But we were just so excited to come up. (laughs) We forgot to wait for the prayer. A couple of months ago, these kids were in junior church with Babs and I, and we started to talk about springtime, and it's kind of finally arrived. It took about that time to get here. And I loved the eyes. Their eyes lit up when that morning when I I brought kazoos. And so we have a little kazoo choir up here. We're going to sing a springtime song, and... When we're done, the kazoos are going to stay on the front bench, and parents, you're welcome to take the kazoos home with you to make noise at your place. Do we have to?
Thank you, thank you. Thank you, children, and thank you, children's department. I wonder why the kazoos had to be left on the front seat. <laughs> I think it's, can't you say amen with a kazoo? <laughs> I think so. Oh, you parents will enjoy that. That'd be wonderful. Let's pray. God, thank you for our children. Thank you for uh, how they fill us with wonder and, and amazement and goodness and beauty. Thank you for what they just did. Help them to remember it and uh, give you more praise. Thank you for each one that's here today, and may you bless your word, and may we hear what you have to say to us. In your name I pray, amen. We're going to be in Luke chapter 15 today, talking about two sons. Luke chapter 15. It's talking about the parable of the lost son. But if you look at Luke chapter 15, Really, if you, the way you read it there, and I will read this. Well, let me read this and I'll make my comment. If you're at Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 3, go this way. Then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to him to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying. Now, all of you good English scholars, when it says he spoke this parable, how many parables is that? I got a finger back there, the only English scholar among us. Oh, there's another one. One, right? One. Now, our Bibles have the parable of the lost sheep, the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the lost son. That is all one parable with three illustrations. Kind of interesting. Something I even learned thinking about it this week. But I was wondering, why was Jesus so attractive it says, all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to hear him. Was he just that much highly educated? Did he use flowery words? Did he wear the latest fashions? Why was he so attractive? And I'm sure they followed him because of the miracles and the feeding of the thousands. But I believe it was mainly because of his love of people. He was so attractive to the tax collectors and sinners. But then why was he so detestable to the Pharisees and the scribes? says the Pharisees and scribes complained and said, look at this person, he eats with sinners and the degenerates and the tax collectors. He was so detestable. Jesus had really rebuked them in the last part of chapter 14 where he said, if salt is no good, it's not even, if it's lost its savor, it's, no good for anything, not even good for the trash pile. You know, he says, if you have ears to hear, let them hear. Let them hear what I have to say. And I was wondering, are we or am I as a Christian attractive to people? And occasionally, I have thought this. When I was 18 years old, what kind of person was I? 
Now, there's nobody here that can answer that. And nobody here knows me when I was 18. But it's like the, 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 the uh, saying I saw says once said, hire a teenager while he still knows it all. You know, and I was probably that kind of teenager. But have you ever thought back when you were 18 or 20 or 30? What kind of person were you? Know it at all? <laughs> you know, were you attractive to people? Or were you obnoxious? You know, was I that way? I don't know. I've often thought about that. And I, well, it's too late to, to go now because that's a few years back. But Jesus was so attractive, attracted to people that we would maybe say, Man, the low life, the, the sinners, the prostitutes, the, the people that were the outcasts. But this one parable talks about three things that were lost. The sheep, the coin, and the son. But Jesus was speaking this parable to what would you say, the, the tax collectors and the sinners? Or was he speaking it to the Pharisees? There were two groups there, and they were, they, were, they were both opposite. One knew it all, and one would say they knew nothing. I think he was speaking to both. He has something in this parable for both. Because some needed compassion, while others had condemnation. And I believe he was speaking, speaking to both. Let's read it. Verse 11. Verse 11 says, Then he said, A certain man had two sons. And the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that falls to me. So he divided to them his likelihood. And I believe he divided to both of them. They both got inheritance. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together, journeyed to a far country, and there wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, there arose a famine, a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country, and he sent him into the fields to feed swine. And he would gladly have filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, but no one gave him anything. But when he came to himself, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have bread enough and to spare, and I perish with hunger. I will rise and go to my father and will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you, and am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me as one of your hired servants. And he arose and went to his father and came to his father. I'd like to stop there. While the money was plentiful, the friends were plentiful. It says he lived a life of prodigal living, wasteful, reckless, luxuriant, lavish, foolish, and most likely sinful. Soon there was no money and there was no fun. Soon there was no money and there was no food. So it says he came to himself. And I was wondering about now, where do you think the tax collectors and sinners were thinking? You know, they had heard this story of someone that was out there living possibly the way they were living. And where do you think the 
tax collector, or the, uh, the, the Pharisees and scribes were thinking about now. Well, I'd have a word for that gentleman, wouldn't, wouldn't you? The Pharisee would be saying, you know. But I believe the, the, the sinners were probably a part of the story. They were recognizing it. They were fitting in there with it. Here's this person that went out and just lived it up. But he did get into trouble. When the money ran out, the fund ran out, the friends ran out, the food ran out, she said, hey, I'll, I'll go back to my father. I'll go back and say, hey, I've sinned. I, I'm, I'm no longer worthy to be your son. No longer worthy to be part of this family because look how wretched I am. Look how poor I am. Look how I've wasted everything. Sometimes we feel that way too, don't we? But the father had other plans, didn't he? Look at the second half of verse 20. It says, when he came back, but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him and had compassion and ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. I wonder if there was some pig smell on him. I'm sure there was. There was riotous living on him. You, know, you can just imagine what he looked like. Maybe he cleaned up, I don't know. But it says he was looking for him and he ran and he kissed him and he fell on him. And his son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight and am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it. And let us eat and be merry. I can imagine that, that was something that the son probably about died over. Here I've been out and, and, and have wasted everything you've given me. And you've been looking for me. And saw me coming. And here I've got a a brand new robe on. I've got a, a ring on my finger. I'm, I'm, I'm back in the family. I've got sandals. I mean, I didn't come home with sandals. And the fatted calf. Steak on the barbie. You know, how, how much better does it get? Did some ribs yesterday. and whew, They were good. Party time. What do you think the Pharisees were thinking? You could probably see them getting red from the neck up, you know. Are you kidding me? Now we know this man, Jesus, isn't worth his salt, you know. Talking about a father like this that, that has compassion but what do you think the, the sinners and the tax collectors were thinking? Yeah, yeah, you know, hey, that's our kind of father. What a story. The father had compassion on the son that went out and just wasted every neck we gave him, everything. Absolutely everything. He had nothing left. And he came back. I bet the scribes and Pharisees were about fit to be tied. But you know, right here in verse 24 is where the third illustration of this parable stops compared to the others. The parable of the 
uh, the lost sheep ends where there is much rejoicing in heaven when it's found. The parable of the lost coin ends where there's much rejoicing because the coin is found. And the end of 24 is equivalent to those two is where the rejoicing begins because the sun is found. So in one parable, all three of these could stop where they did, but Jesus takes the third illustration just a bit further. He says it's time to take it a step further and let's find out what the Pharisees have to say. So, Jesus goes from the son that was lost and came back, had wasted everything and he was forgiven, to the son that was home. The son that we might call the good son. He didn't go out and squander anything. The first son did, but he stayed home. He was the model son. So verse 25 goes this way. Now the older son was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said to him, your brother has come and because he has received him safe and sound, your father has killed the fatted calf. But he was angry and would not go in. Therefore his father came out and pleaded with him. So he answered and said to his father, Lo, these many years I have been serving you. I have never transgressed your commandment at any time. And yet you never gave me a young goat that I might make merry with my friends. But as soon as this son of yours came who has devoured your livelihood with harlots, who said anything about harlots? You killed the fatted calf for him. And he said to him, Son, you are always with me. And all that I have is yours. It was right that we should make merry and glad. For your brother was dead and is alive again and was lost and is found. The older son disliked finding what he found. Says he was in the field, he was working. And so when he came close to the house, he heard music and dancing. And You know, if, if you were like that, wouldn't you say, well, let's go in and find out what's going on? But he asked the servant. He didn't want to go in. His brother was received home safe and sound. You would think that possibly the servant coming out and telling the older son that, hey, your, son, your brother's here and, and your father has killed the fatted calf and, and he's received him, that it would make him feel good, wouldn't it? But it didn't. The, the, the reaction was anger. He was not in any way ready to celebrate his father had accepted his wayward son. And this was something he did not like what he found. He found that his brother had come home and he had found that his father had accepted him, but he could not accept him. He also could not express any sympathy. He could not express any sympathy, so what did his father do? His father came out to him. What did his father do for the younger son? He was looking for him. The father actually had two lost sons. This is not really the parable of the lost son. It's the parable of the lost sons. They were both lost. The father came out and looked down the road for his first son. 
just longing for him. And his father came out also to the second son and longed for him to come in too. It shows us that God is a seeking God. And that God is seeking everyone. God is seeking those that are lost far away, those that are lost in sin, those that are lost in extravagance and in all kinds of, of, of things, but God is also seeking those that are lost sitting in a church pew that think they have salvation, but it's possibly just a ritual. You know, people are lost in different spec- spectrums, but God is seeking Oh, God's a seeking God. The father came out. He was looking down the road and he came out to entreat his son to come in. Because the father longs for his children. But there was an absence of forgiveness in the older son here. He could not forgive his younger son. He could not express any sympathy. He could not forgive. And he was like the Pharisees. And I I, I bet the Pharisees really resonated with this guy. No, we can't accept him. We can't believe in him. We can't accept. He was lost. We can't forgive him. He's got to pay for it. You know, but the same grace of God that woos everyone, no matter if there's addicts or a six-year-old, the same grace is wooing every one of us. He couldn't even say, my brother. You see that? He says, as soon as this son of yours, as soon as my brother comes back, no, he wasn't his brother, It was the father's son. He couldn't even see or say his his brother. He didn't like what he found. He couldn't express any sympathy. And he couldn't accept the necessity of what the father did. Look in verse 32. It says, it was right. The father is talking to the son. It says, it was right that we should make Mary and be glad. It was right. We should do something because he was lost and he's found. He was dead and now he is alive. The older son viewed himself as a model son. He was living in the father's house as a slave, wasn't he? I've done everything you've told me to do. It was a matter of activity, a matter of what he was doing. He couldn't accept what had happened. And his father just didn't dream this up. It was right. He didn't understand grace, did he? He didn't have a song to sing as the younger son did. That he was saved by grace. By the grace that his father had given him. He didn't understand the forgiveness of God. You know, I believe Jesus was speaking to the Pharisees as much as he was speaking to the sinners. Telling them both that God loves everyone. The Pharisees were a breed of separatists. But they perverted their separations by the way they withdrew and despised people. This son was really acting like a Pharisee. He didn't want to get close to his younger brother. His younger brother had sinned. His younger brother was estranged. His younger brother didn't deserve grace. He was the one that had loved the father. He was the one that was always with him. His younger son, brother, didn't deserve this. He didn't like Jesus' involvement 
the Pharisees didn't like Jesus' involvement with the, with the tax collectors. Look at blind Bartimaeus was crying by the road and they say, be quiet, be quiet. Jesus says, no, bring him to me. Bring him to me. They found Jesus one day speaking to the woman by the well. Rabbis were not to speak to women. And how would Jesus allow a prostitute to come in and anoint his feet with perfume? The Pharisees couldn't understand that. They said, let's separate. Let's not be a part of this. You know, I believe also we need to guard against Phariseeism in all of our hearts. But the motivation for purity and holiness of life is absolutely unquestionable, and we should desire that. But the real challenge comes when we confront with issues that just don't fit our category. You know, Jesus said, a new commandment I give you, that you love one another. And that's easy to say, isn't it? That you love one another. But it's hard to do, isn't it? We find ourselves with categories or instances in our lives that we say, how do we love this? How do we accept this? The older brother had condemnation. Jesus and the father had compassion. While others were partying and making merry, he was outside brooding. He was outside condemning. He was outside not accepting. While the father and the son was inside making merry. When Jesus spent time with tax collectors and sinners, wasn't he just showing us divine compassion? Divine compassion. How do you as a Christian honor God, obey his word, and treat your neighbors, friends, and family members who have, divide, who have decided to go down this wrong path? How do we treat the LGBTQ people. When it happens in our families, when it happens in the neighborhood, when it happens all around us, whether it's family or whether it's not, or whether it's acquaintances. Well, some have said that they'll use admonition and continue to admonish. And I believe if the Spirit leads you, yes, you should say a word. But some people have, well, I need to say something. Well, others may say, well, I just won't say anything. And just not say anything. Isn't that the easiest way? Neither of these are good for a Bible-believing Christian. We are to love everyone, including our enemies, most LGBTQ persons are either condemned or affirmed. Think about that. They're either condemned or affirmed. But the Christian, I think, has to say that we will not treat you in either one of these ways. We can't condemn you. Neither can we affirm you. We can't condemn you because God tells us to love. We can't affirm you because we believe that the Bible speaks otherwise. But yet we are to love. We are to have compassion. We cannot condemn you. We neither can affirm you. The reason is because of the Bible. God's love. Because of his grace and goodness. He calls us to love. Realizing how this grace has been extended to us and extended to everyone. We are to love. And really we're called to that supernatural work of loving. It's supernatural. 
There's a lot of stuff that comes in each one of our lives that it's hard to deal with. Many things, many issues, many things in our life. But we're called to a supernatural Holy Spirit loving. We need to do what people don't expect us to do, to love them. We, don't, we will not get contaminated. If we understand the forgiveness of God. And I believe that the younger brother understood forgiveness. Because the same grace that pursues me and pursues pursued you is the same grace that pursues the addicts, the downcast, the ones that are far from God, and the same grace that pursues a six-year-old that is learning about Jesus. It's that same grace. So compassion or condemnation. If you think about compassion, compassion leaves the door open, doesn't it? For conversation, for acceptance, for love. Condemnation closes the door. I come back to my beginning there of first three verses. It says, then all the tax collectors and the sinners drew near to hear what he had to say. Why was Jesus so attractive? Are we, am I, an attractive person today? Not physically. I know that. Somebody else rolled their eyes. But it's what I do. Am I attracting people? Am I having compassion? Or by the things that I do, by the way I act, by the, the, the people that I interact with, am I condemning and am I not attracting people? I believe Jesus had compassion. He was attractive. He was attracted to the people that knew they would receive love, acceptance. Yes, they would receive the truth. But he would love them. We need to do the same. Like I said, it's easier said than done. And it's supernatural. God can do it through us. Let's pray. God, thank you for the story of that you've given here. Two sons, both lost. I believe one knew grace. One somehow hopefully learned it. Help us, God, to know and to learn that the compassion that you love your children with is the compassion and love that we need to love everybody. And allow you to be the one that gives the judgment. We just thank you. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. When clouds fail, sun, and disaster comes, oh my soul. Oh, my soul, when waters rise and hope takes flight, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, oh, my soul, ever faithful, ever 
brought rain Disaster came Oh my soul Oh my soul Waters rose Hope had flown Oh my soul Oh my soul, oh my soul, ever faithful, ever true, you I know, you never let go. Let's go.